This is the podcast of the California Institute of Integral Studies, where we bring you conversations and lectures from our public program series, featuring world-renowned scholars, leaders, authors, artists, and thinkers. To make sure you never miss an episode of the CIIS Public Programs Podcast, find us and subscribe on iTunes or on our website at ciis.edu slash podcast. Hello. So exciting to see you all here. And I am beyond excited to have this conversation. We've just met today and already it's like, we have so much to talk about. How are we going to fit it into an hour? We do. And I'm all, I got to be honest, hearing your bio, I'm a little scared because of all the psychology. Psychology. I feel, I feel psychology. like you're going to read me, like read me a lot. Well, you know, the, the first rule about becoming a psychologist is that you don't analyze people, Okay. you know, as party trick, although... <laughs> How many of you out here are psychologists? I bet people are like, ha ha, that's true, but right. we do, right? <laughs> uh huh. So there might be a little of that. Right, right, right. But we'll, you know, I have some questions that I've created, and um, I'm just going to kind of read a little bit from the questions, but I really want this to be a conversation. So, if, like, pop in with something if, if you think of something and it's like not part of the question, okay? Cool, we'll do. All right. Um, so, I. First and foremost, because this is a podcast and I want to spread this to the entire world, this book literally will change your life. (laughs) I'm telling you, I could not put it down. It's so resonant, especially with so much of what we do here at CIAS, that I felt like you were speaking to me, to my faculty, to my students, to my community. And this message is just so important for the world. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. For making time to be here with us today. It's always so exciting to hear that. Like, as a, as a, have any of you written a book or done any, like, long-form writing of any kind, poetry, essays, anything? Anytime you write, like, it's, it's deeply personal. Um, and it's always kind of a shocker, at least certainly for my first book, a shocker when you get out in the world and people tell you that it resonated. That's obviously why you write it. Um, But it's kind of surreal. So I appreciate that. Yeah. (laughs) And that leads me sort of right into the first thing I wanted to touch on, which is there, I took away from this book because of course it's about changing stories to change your life, to change, then change the world. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this phrase just kept running through my head that like narrative is the way Mm -hmm. that the story is the way. Yeah. And, um, you know, this, this book is really your story of kind of waking up, Mm -hmm. dropping out for a bit Mm -hmm. and developing what you're calling narrative intelligence. And I'm really curious, what is this narrative intelligence? Like, what is it to you and how do you want us to start using it. Yeah. I mean, so as you just said, the the book kind of begins, um, or the story of the book begins with me walking away from um, my career and life as I knew it, as in, I guess, an, a late 20s millennial, right? Um, and I, I don't usually like to talk about myself or anybody else with generational labels, because sometimes they mean absolutely nothing. But it is relevant to this conversation, because so much of what I talk about in the book, and what I looked at in my own life when I kind of got frustrated with my career uh, and where I was in the world had been shaped by narratives that I think were in some ways very unique to our generation, um, or certainly the amount that the narratives and stories of the world had had infiltrated our lives and our minds, right? Whether we're talking about with social media, um, through popular culture, just these very, very popular narratives about who we are and how we're supposed to live our life and what the world is supposed to give us and, and how we're supposed to interact with it. All of these stories, um, whether or not we realize them, have shaped literally everything we do, our behaviors, what we, how we seek partners, how we seek careers and jobs, um, how we view ourselves. And so... When I hit this point, I'd had a a relatively successful career pretty quickly, um, and I was high profile at like 27 years old. I was on television, and I was going to the White House and doing all the fancy stuff that looks amazing on Instagram. Um, But but I wasn't – I hate using the term happy because that sounds very superficial. It 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 was more than happiness. I was very frustrated with where I felt I was headed. Right, I didn't. I didn't feel like what was happening around me and the life that I'd created was real, 
Um, I felt like a lot of it was pretend, a lot of it was pretense, and a lot of it wasn't lining up with what I believe to be my values. Um, and so <laughs> I don't advise anyone doing it in this way, but I, I abruptly quit my job. And by abruptly, I mean, I sent an email one morning and I was like, thanks, that was great, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had just gotten married. I was in my new, like, grown-up apartment with fancy furniture and, and quitting a job. This is one of the first narratives that I confronted is quitting a job is not something that people like me are supposed to do. Um, first of all, n- no one is ever supposed to quit. But when you see the quitting stories, like in movies, like the Jerry Maguire moment, right, th- they're usually like young white men. Um, and I'm, I was a young black woman. Um, and I don't come from wealth. I, don't, I come from an environment where you work. You don't have to be happy to work. You work. Um, and so even in that moment, I was saying, okay, whoa, this is jarring. I wasn't taught the story that, that people like me are able to not, I don't even like the term quitting. What I did was I walked away from something that wasn't serving me. And I always encourage people to be able to take that freedom if and when necessary to not look at it as quitting and giving up, but instead saying, hey, I have to stop doing the thing that is not fulfilling me in order to find something else. Um, And so that's what I did. And the process and the journey that the book lays out, um, I then in hindsight was able to codify and call narrative intelligence. Um, And I define it in the book as the ability to understand and see the stories that are shaping our lives. Um, You know, we're taught about IQ. We're taught about, you know, emotional intelligence. Uh, But I don't know about you, I wasn't taught how to see stories. We're we're fish in water, right? They are all around us. Uh, And I was never given a skill set um, to be able to stop in any given moment and assess and analyze. And I always say people, you know, think that answers change the world. I believe that the right questions can change the world. And so if we're not ever taught how to ask the right questions about what we're consuming, about how our brains are processing information, about what we're thinking about the world around us, then we just behave in ways um, that I think are potentially outside of what serves us. And so that was where I got. That's fabulous. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the way in which you talk about narrative intelligence, I love the structure, and we're going to unpack it as okay. we're talking tonight. Um, and the reason I think that it was so resonant and that I've been talking to all of my faculty in the Expressive Arts Therapy Program about it is that we use a form of therapy called narrative therapy a lot, which is also about unpacking how people story their lives. And um, we also are very much oriented toward social justice and concepts in liberation psychology around creative resistance Mm. and around locations of people's identity and that we as therapists have to be very cognizant of our multiple locations of both privilege and oppression Mm -hmm. and also those of our clients Mm -hmm. and recognizing how power is part of the storytelling process to whose story becomes a big question. And I'm going to quote you from Instagram because I've been following you (laughs) on Instagram now. You're amazing. Um, It's hilarious because I have such a love-hate, mostly hate relationship with social media. So that's Oh, I I firmly feel you. (laughs) And we're going to talk about that too. (laughs) Um, So this is what you said, and this is from your book. And this is your quote. Don't rush to believe that something is wrong with you before first investigating the wrongness of your environment. And that just poof, just blew me away. And I just, I, I'm you know, flipping through my phone and I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, good question. Good, good, good. And part of it was that, you know, you described four types of narratives or four types of stories. And they're the internal, firsthand, produced, and myths. And as I read your work, I really recognized that, like, the locations of my own intersections of identity Mm -hmm. were foregrounding and backgrounding as I was exploring those four types. You know, I could feel different parts of myself that have gone unstoried or are storied by others Mm -hmm. because of how I look and present. And oftentimes people will talk to me about my own identity. Yeah. And they have about seven of the nine categories completely wrong. <laughs> uh-huh. And so 
that was one of those places where I was like, wow, okay, this is a great tool for us to be having conversations about, you know, identity and projections. And one of the things you also talk about is the process of getting story smart. Yes. And I think that's an amazing concept. And I wondered if you could share a bit about what that process is like um, and how it helps us to really get clear about this wrongness of the environment yeah. idea. That was a really important um, idea for me to include in the book. And it's so funny, when I was first writing it, because I come from um, an advocacy background and consider myself a social critic, you know, I said, this is going to be a book that is social critique. And my editor said, no, this is self-help. And I was like, no, 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 don't call it that. Don't call it that. And she's like, you call it what you want. That's where it's going to be on the bookshelf. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and so it was important for me as I was now all of a sudden writing a self-help book um, to kind of complicate the narrative a little bit and reject this idea that everything that is wrong comes from inside. I think sometimes that is the the narrative that we take from self-help. It is, it is not all content that is personal development. But I think sometimes we are so quick to look inside and blame ourselves. And um, I think this is in that same Instagram post. I think I said something to the effect of um, self-help culture has taught us that if we are responsible for our own happiness, then we must also be the cause of our own discontent. And I firmly reject that idea. Couldn't right? agree with you more. Um, and so it was important that if we're going to talk about stories, and yes, it, we are responsible for changing them. I'm not taking anyone off the hook for that. Uh, I think it's more, more important and just as important to understand where they come from, that we are not born with these, uh, that these are systems and structures and narratives about identity, about money, uh, right? That, that capitalism is a system. It is a structure, like it, love it, hate it, whatever it is, it has implications. It tells certain stories, right? And we believe those. And somehow then come to, when we don't live up to certain expectations, think it's our fault, right? What did I do wrong? Why do I feel this way? Uh, and the reality is, I don't think if we, uh, if we continue to, to look at ourselves that way, we'll ever actually be able to challenge some of the systems that aren't serving us. We'll ever be able to actually push back and say, no, 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 I'm not going to believe that anymore. It's not coming from in here. It's coming from out there. And then harness our energy to challenge that. So that is why I, I started with that idea. Um, I actually pulled from Melissa Harris Perry's work where she talks about, and I put this in the book, uh, my own interpretation of the story, but a, something called the crooked room theory. And it comes from um, a 1950s field dependent study where people were placed into a room where everything in the room was crooked. The pictures on the wall, the chair, the floor, the carpeting, everything was crooked. And then the person was asked to stand up straight. Uh, and the study would report that people would say that they were straight when really they were actually 30 to 40 degrees bent over. They thought they were straight. And so when I heard that, I said, wow, so I guess in order to really stand up straight, you have to feel a little crazy, right? When you realize that the room is crooked, if you are going to make a choice that, okay, I'm going to live differently or I'm going to believe something different, uh, I'm going to first see the crookedness. That's what Story Smart is. Story Smart is saying, oh, I see it now. Then in order to stand up, you're not going to feel comfortable. You're going to feel a little out of whack with the rest of society or with the rest of your colleagues or classmates. Um, and I, I, I lay out that process also, I think, hopefully in a really human and authentic way. In the book, I, I don't just make it sound like I decided to quit my job one day and then I went about building a new life. No, I quit my job and walked downstairs and was like, did I really just quit my job? Maybe that was a mistake. And then I panicked for like two months. Um, and I did, I went through all the motions, right, of people would ask me like, what are you doing next? And I would lie, mm -hmm. right? The yeah. lies that came out of my, oh, I'm starting a business. I mean, really. I, I was like rewriting my bio every morning at 3 a.m. Like, In maybe your now I do this. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. I do this, right? And I wanted to be transparent about that. Because first of all, I know I'm not the only one. Um, and second of all, because I want to show you, it, it is a jarring process. You don't know what you're doing or who you are when you first make the choice, when you're like, oh, everything else is crooked. I got to stand up. What do I do next? Mm -hmm. um, so I also wrote the book really for people um, who kind of have that feeling a little bit. 
and are trying to figure it out to say, A, it's okay, B, it's not you, um, and C, here is a lens through which you can look at your journey and the next phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And something that you don't write about explicitly, but I really resonated with in the book was the idea that, you know, we as humans have a very low tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> yes. It's, you know, certainty is sort of the thing. And yet you you really go in depth about being in what I would really call a liminal space, you know, the gray area for a long time. Like you tolerated that. Yeah. And how did you, how did you take it? Like, how did you well, make it through? What, what was... I think if you, if you. you are committed to, if you are committed to a healthy outcome, you don't really know what the outcome is going to be yet, but if you are committed to, I, I want whatever the process I'm in right now, if I'm going to go through this, I want to be better on the other side. If you're committed to that, then you're like, so I will sit through whatever I need to sit through. I, I didn't really have a choice. Um, I actually talk a lot about the idea of certainty in the chapter on faith. Um, so if you, usually if you talk to me for, I don't know, any length of time, over 30 seconds, you find out that I'm a preacher's kid. Um, it's, it's a core part of my DNA, um, both in my upbringing, but also in the way that I see the world. Um, and in this process, I had to kind of wrestle with faith, too. Because if I'm going to build a new life, right, that's, that's a part of it. What does that mean for me? Uh, and the conclusion that I came through, I'm, I'm not giving it all away, but I will say through a, a, a whole series of events and occurrences and, you know, research and study and prayer and all these things, I kind of came to this realization that for our generation and, and probably for, for most generations, certainly for many, many that came before us as well, um, faith became synonymous with religion and then religion um, became synonymous with certainty. For most of my life, even if, forget my personal context, even the political context or the sociocultural context, it was religion means this. If you are this, you know this. You know for certain how the world was created in how many days and in what order. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And I say this as someone who, let me also be very clear, is still both spiritual and religious. They are different things and I am both. Um, but my understanding of what, what they meant was shaped by these stories. That everything was all about certainty and you had to know this and believe this and this is life and this is how you define it and this is what that means. And if not, then you're a bad this or you're not one of these at all. And, and I was like, nah, not buying it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just not, not buying it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you know, in, in my understanding of, the, of, of, of a big, awesome, ultimately unknowable God, I, I started reading the works of um, uh, a rabbi who used to... Dr. King, uh, Martin Luther King called him his rabbi. Um, he was front and center with him in the civil rights movement, Abraham, Hesh Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, and he writes about an ineffable God, one that we can't even fully wrap our minds around. Uh, and it shifted kind of my religious practice and my faith to being far less about certainty and far more about wonder. And just w what is it when you are in a posture of awe and wonder? And even if you're not a religious or and identify as a spiritual person, that approach to life is part of how I got through my journey. It was, I don't know. I'm looking at this. I'm in awe that I'm still here, <laughs> right? I'm in awe that me not understanding how, what I'm going to do for my job the next six months, and yet somehow here I am, and there's still food on the table. I'm grateful, and I'm in awe. And kind of approaching life in that way um, helps you be, I think, a bit more open to new ideas, new possibilities, and creating new stories. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I share that we're both pastor's kids. Yeah. And so part of what I was so curious about, and, and my opinion is that the, the wife of these pastors is also a spiritual force of nature. Oh, oftentimes. yeah. My, my mom is actually more of a force of, spiritual force <laughs> of nature than my dad. Uh -huh. and, but what's it, what's it like for you to have grown up in the house of a spiritual leader? And how does that influence how you're walking in the world in this work now? Yeah. I mean, this is when the chair should turn into a therapist's couch. Yes. And we could talk for okay. hours. Okay. I know. Um, I feel like this is... Uh, well, so I guess to understand what that meant for me, I, st I start the book. I said the story of the book begins with like me quitting my job. But the intro to the book 
the kind of foundation of my life begins with um, the story of my father's death. And I won't get into all of the details of how that occurred. Um, it is in the book. But, uh, but it happened when I was 16 years old. And up until that point, and and even beyond that point, um, you know, I was and remain a daddy's girl. Uh, so everything about everything about my daddy, his lifestyle, being a pastor, being a spiritual leader, and and one that I can truly say in the fiber of my being was authentic and with integrity. Um, you know, I saw the world through his eyes. I saw the world as an opportunity to serve. Uh, and, and that was the way our home was. It, we were the house that if you needed a place to stay, if you needed food, if you needed to be bailed out of jail in the middle of the night, our phone was the one ringing. Um, and, and so that was the way that I looked at the world. And then when he passed away, it, it shifted a little bit. It actually kind of gave me a little bit more of a political awakening because, and I didn't include this in the book at all, but, uh, at his home going service, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And the the line, they were all coming up to tell me and my sister and my mother um, these amazing stories about how he had helped them. He'd helped me get a job. He helped me get into rehab. He, you know, renewed my faith, all of these stories. And they were supposed to make me feel good. And I I was pissed. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Mm -mm, no, because what I didn't understand was if one person could give every single thing that he had and, and help change this many people's lives, why was why did the community still look the same? Where did this line end? And it was kind of my first awakening to, oh, there are systems and structures outside of that. There's more than just direct service, and there is more than just kind of spiritual education and formation, but there are also, like, I got pretty radical at that point. Um, but so, so that is, I think, one way. That's just the foundation. I also think... Um, being a religious person and growing up in in such a religious environment, and I don't mean that in, in coded language. That doesn't really have anything to do with our politics. I just mean like, no, we talked to Jesus all day long <laughs> in our house. Like it was just that was I was in church all week long. It actually prepared me a great deal for the idea of narrative intelligence because I grew up in an environment where like we were expected to see see things that everybody else didn't see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And everything's told through story. Everything was told through story. So I was primed for understanding story and then understanding that stories had a meaning beyond what I could see with my natural eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, so, so what really happened as an adult was just that I started to understand what the stories were and how they were impacting me. Um, but I grew up learning about discernment. Learning how to, like, when you engage with people, feeling things that maybe they didn't communicate with their mouth, but they did with their body or their energy or their spirit. Um, I grew up in an environment where you were supposed to be vulnerable and you were supposed to talk about life and struggle and you were supposed to testify about the good things and cry with one another about the bad things. Um, And even to your point about, you know, pastors' wives um, were the spouses of these spiritual leaders. When my father passed away, my mother took over the church. She's the senior pastor of, of I mean, I don't live at home anymore, but of our home church to this day, mm-hmm. um, which was drama, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so it, it shaped so much, and I understand that that is a privilege. It's a, it's a privilege because the older I got and then I went to work in politics, I realized, like, oh, I had been in this happy little social justice, religious cocoon, uh, completely unaware. I was actually ashamed in college to find out um, what religion had done to the world in so many cases, mm-hmm. um, particularly, I mean, not, not, no, not even, not uniquely in the U.S., just around the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so it became my mission at that point, too, to kind of see if I could reconcile that in any way in my own life, with my own activism, uh, and my own faith journey. Mm -hmm. And a while back, you said, you know, that the book was going to be on the self-help shelf, but really for you, this was a a commentary, a social commentary. And as I didn't say it at the time, but I was sitting here thinking, well, social justice is self-help. Yeah. You know, we, we do the inner work because the outer work is calling and we end up needing to do both. Mm-hmm. And and activists who don't do their work fry. Yeah. You know, they burn out. Yeah. So I just wanted to affirm that I'll call your publisher. That makes me feel so much I'll talk better. to your Thank editor. You. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we're going to dive into politics, speaking of social okay. justice. Okay. Um, you know, I assume that you are still keeping up, even though you are not on on news talk shows very often. Um, and I would love to hear from you in this in the climate that we're living in, but particularly about the AOC phenomenon, mm-hmm. as I'm calling it, mm-hmm. and the extraordinary election of women of color this past election cycle. What's your, what's your narrative about what you're seeing and about how you're experiencing the AOC phenomenon? So have you see, did you see the documentary, the new Netflix documentary? Um, I think it's called, is it Bring, Knock Down the House? Not yet, but now I will. Please watch it. It, is, um, it started off as a, uh, a look at four women who were running for office. Uh, and AOC happened to be one of them. They had no idea when they were filming that, that she was going to win. Um, in fact, the narrative that the documentarians had re- pretty much planned for and expected was all of the women were going to lose. And the whole point of the documentary was to show how hard it was going to be, how hard it is and remains to be a woman running for office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and instead she won and they captured this moment. It was just unreal. Um, but I, I left so inspired And it re-energized me um, that there are so many people. I mean, public service is a sacrifice. I, I, it's a, it is a true sacrifice. And I know that right now it might look somewhat glamorous because of Twitter and, you know, like she's, she's on all the talk shows and, but it is a sacrifice. No sleep. No sleep. And also the the level of particularly the way that I think she is doing it the level of vulnerability and exposure, mm-hmm. um, so I'm inspired by that, uh, both by her but also by the the women whose names we don't know who are running for local office who are you know <laughs> stepping up in their communities and and sometimes losing and sometimes getting knocked back down I'm always inspired by that. Um, there's a part of me that questions the short-term impact of it all, right? I think, I think there's always an impact when you see um, different people doing things and different people in leadership positions that, that there's an impact for the next generation and that it opens the door for more. But I do sometimes question, like, are, what does that mean for right now? Um, and I hope that my husband and I always have this question. In the book, I call him Lifetime Bay, LB. <laughs> He's my <laughs> Lifetime Bay. Um, but we always talk about, like, w- what made the, the activists that came before us and even those that are still alive today that who put their lives on the line and give everything for a cause and movement, do they ever have a moment where they look back and say, was it worth it? What do you think? I don't know. I, I, the ones that I know that are kind of in my peer group now, mm-hmm. I think have a much better understanding of self care, um, at least the ones that I know and talk to now, than than our predecessors did. And so I hope it actually doesn't take their lives from them in the way that it, it took so many who came before us. Um, but that is something I often think about too, as we're seeing so many uh, young women and women of color on the front lines. Is that I want something for the country. I want something for the world. I also want something for them. Mm -hmm. I want them to be okay and to be safe and to live full lives. And so I hope we are at the point in history where both things can occur. That's, that is my, my wish and prayer for right now. And for everyone who is out there fighting the fight that, um, I think you have to be called to fight in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now that you've shifted your career a bit, do you still feel called? And if so, what does that look like? Oh my gosh. Yes. All right. Um, (laughs) what I've learned over time, um, I mean, I knew this then, but I think I've learned it more as I've journeyed throughout my own life is that literally it's a, a phrase that comes from the Bible and that we used to say growing up in church, but that every joint supplies. And what that meant was that there's a role for absolutely everyone. Uh, And that your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to figure out your role. And your role is not going to look the same as someone else's role. And so my role is no longer, at least not in this season of my life, to um, pay my bills via politics. 
Um, but I believe, just as I believe we are all spiritual beings, I think that whether we acknowledge it or not, we are all inherently political beings. Um, and so I actually feel in some ways so much more free now um, to kind of have my politics infuse every area of my life. I feel freer now than I did when it was my job in mm-hmm. some ways. Because mm-hmm. um, you're speaking for yourself and not in the context of a paycheck. Right, not in the context of a paycheck, not in the context of an organization. And also I'm able to be much clearer about how I come to the table and what I bring. Mm-hmm. You know, I think at a particular point in my career, it was expected, and, and frankly, because I said so, right, that I was expected to bring a sharp political mind, um, you know, and maybe I have that, maybe I don't, but I would actually prefer what I bring to the table to be creating spaces like this. I create spaces. Um, that's what my mission is, my calling in life is, is to create spaces and ask critical questions that develop wisdom and help people change themselves and the world. You bring me to the table if that's what you want. If you want campaign strategy, I have many, many friends um, who can do that. You'll refer out. I will refer one. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, right but on. if you want to ask the tough questions, if you want to have meaningful conversations, if you want to get to the heart of an issue, right, beyond the talking points, mm-hmm. then I'll come. And then we can we can work together and then you can sign folks up for the campaign after. And it's so important at this point, because um, as we've been witnessing divisiveness and anger and combativeness, vitriol even Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the tone of how we have all begun talking to one another. And it's really it's um, I don't know, it makes my soul wither on a regular basis. And so it just seems really important. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say something that might even be controversial a oh, little good. bit, which is, Bring it. you know, I, <laughs> I don't know that we all need to talk to each other. Keep going. No, come on. Keep going. I think, I think, um, I think <laughs> everyone needs to be talked to <laughs> at some point, but I don't think everyone needs to talk to everybody. And I sometimes get very frustrated with this narrative, right, that, that we all have to go out and we all have to talk to the people who are potentially trying to kill us. No, not today. <laughs> I'm not doing that today. Um, and also, I believe that there's some people who are called to do that, right? And in a, in a much lighter example, I have friends who are um, very, very progressive, uh, who love going on Fox News. Love it. It's like a sport for them? It's a, it's a sport, and I will also say, I mean, I make fun of them, but I also do believe in some cases it's a calling. Uh-huh. I think it is, right? You have to go <laughs> where you're not wanted sometimes. Um, you know, and they all have very different reasons for doing it, um, and I think that's valuable. That's not my calling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I know people who are very deep in racial justice work who say, it is my calling to talk to other people of color only, And some who are on the road talking, some people of color I know are on the road talking to all white audiences all the time. Both are valuable. Mm -hmm. Both, you know. Um, But I wouldn't swap those two people out. (laughs) I wouldn't switch who they are. Um, And so so that's, that's what I've learned over time, too, is that, like, yes, the tone that we have right now is so disgusting and so painful. And I, I believe that part of that comes from the wrong people um, the wrong messengers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this segues into something that I'm, I really am curious about with you, which is the world of social media yeah, and the strangely love hate relationship that many of us have mm-hmm. with those tools. Um, and I, I introduced, uh, Erica or didn't introduce her, but when we were talking, preparing for this, I said, do you happen to know your Enneagram type? How many of you out there are Enneagram people? Any of you? So it's a personality typology system, kind of like the Myers-Briggs, um, that, full disclosure, I sort of live my whole life <laughs> through that lens. Um, as a type four, that's not unusual. And <laughs> I don't know um, these yet. I was on my way driving up here today to get ready. I was listening to Hannah, pa- um, Hannah Posh, who's coming here in a couple weeks, too, to do her talk. And um, she had a woman named Sue Ann, uh, Sue Ann Shaw on her um, show 
that I was listening to today, who's a three on the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. And she also self-identifies as a person of color, a queer Christian female singer-songwriter. And I was like, wow, that's a constellation of identities. It's so powerful. And a lot of her work, um, she's been writing um, a little bit of pushback against Brene Brown and sort of mm. the vulnerability craze. Mm-hmm. And her critique is that there's a, a – a, a privileged whiteness in this idea of being vulnerable at all times with all people. Mm. And that for people who have locations of identity that are either oppressed or marginalized, that it's not always right for them to be mm-hmm. ongoingly, permanently vulnerable with all people. And it made me think of what you were just talking about, about like, I don't know that we need to be talking to everybody. Right, right. And you talked about being vulnerable in your in your social justice church bubble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so with this framing in mind, I'm curious about how do you approach vulnerability mm-hmm. if you do? Mm-hmm. I'm making an assumption, so I'm going to back <laughs> off. But if you do think about vulnerability and practice some form of vulnerability, what's that like in your work? Because your book is so open-hearted and so real. And yet I was, I had this moment of, okay, what stories made it onto the page and what stories Mm -hmm. didn't? Yeah. I mean, I've just found in my life that realness invites realness. Um, And especially because I did grow up in an environment as lovely as it was, as wonderful as it was being a pastor's kid. um, There was also a lot of like, you don't talk about that outside of your house, outside of your family. Right. Um, So I've I've always kind of had lines. I don't like pour my guts out everywhere, but I do try. I do try to always say the thing that I believe someone else in the room is feeling or thinking. I know I I I don't ever walk into a space thinking that I'm alone. I just don't do it. If I have a feeling, I just start from the premise of somebody else is feeling this. I I just know it, um, and so that kind of helps me with my vulnerability. I'll say something. And even if I feel like, okay, maybe most of the people in the room don't feel this way, I go away thinking someone does. That also comes from church. My father used to always say that when he was preaching, which is like, I don't know who this is for, but this is for somebody. (laughs) That's how I kind of always feel when I talk. (laughs) I don't know who this is for, but I know it's for somebody. And if I know it hits somebody, then I'm good. Um, And so it doesn't mean I walk through the world. And even to go back to that critique of Brene Brown, I actually really like Renee Brown. I really like her work. Uh, I think I have heard her say very clearly that, you know, you don't need to be an open wound and vulnerable all the time. Um, I, I think vulnerability, though, no matter who you are, what concerns me also about kind of that alternative narrative is that it, it, um, it suggests that certain people don't need to be vulnerable or it's not mm-hmm. – vulnerable – We all have to be vulnerable sometimes, somewhere. I don't care what your race, your gender is, your sexual orientation. Vulnerability is a human thing. I am human. I have the right to be vulnerable, just like you do. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, yes, we should all be wise about how and where and, and, and what we share. Um, and I think that just comes from, again, lived experience and, you know, you, you learn a stove is hot by touching it. Maybe, maybe every now and then you, you say something somewhere, you know, that, that isn't safe and then you pull back. Uh, but I think the practice of vulnerability, uh, is very, very important for, for growth, but also for building community. You know, I've only ever found my people by being able to say, this is who I am. If you don't say this is who you are, no one knows who you are and they can't say that's who I am too, right? Um, And and so that was the process I went through when writing the book, you know? Um, I have a chapter in there about love, which means I had to talk about my relationship with my husband. Uh, I mean, certainly there were things I didn't put in, uh, but but I was able to, I talked about them. I talked about my family. Um, I talked about... (laughs) without being very specific, former coworker, like I talked about my life. Um, and while I'm not suggesting that everyone go out and write a book, you know, you don't have to put it all on paper. To get back to your initial question about social media, mm-hmm. um, I, I've hated it for a very long time, even at, at, coming from someone who was ahead of the creator's lab at Snapchat, right? Um, I found that most of the vulnerability online was performative, mm-hmm. I, a lot, we're just so pretend- carefully curated. Yeah, we're pretending to be vulnerable. Um, when my 
relationship with social media changed, frankly, very recently. I'm talking about like within the past couple of months. Um, and frankly, it, it was uh, inspired by my publisher telling me I had to. They're like, you're going to need to post. And I'm like, no, what am I going to do? So I kind of had to come to terms with, okay, Erica, what is your problem with social media? You know, all comes back to the stories. What is the story that you've been told about the use of this platform? Um, And the shift happened for me when I said, okay, I'm comfortable sitting up here talking to a thousand of you or one of you. That doesn't bother me. So what is it about social media that concerns me? Oh, it's the, the, that it's, a space created for validation. And then if you don't get the validation, something might be wrong or you need to change. And I said, so what if I eliminated that and I considered social media to be my platform for ministry, that my goal is the same as it is when I'm in a room. If I reach one, then I'm okay. What if I looked at everything I posted just like that? If I reach one person, then I'm happy I posted it as opposed to how many likes am I going to get? Is the algorithm going to serve this? What did people think? No comments and engagement. I mean, I get all of that very deeply because, again, I worked in that industry. Um, but I've chosen to now use my space just to, and it doesn't mean it has to always be deep, uh, but just to share truth that I feel like needs to be shared for someone today. Uh, and now I have a, a certain level of ease with it. I still stress out about taking selfies, um, but but the content feels a lot more natural to me. So I, I think the advice that I would give, because I do talk to especially younger people all the time, is make a choice. So much of what I talk about in the book is just about intentionality. It's not about me saying, you know, this needs to be your new story and that story is bad for you. It's about saying, know what you believe and know why you do what you do. And so when you choose to engage in social media, do what you want. Just know why. Know what your intention is. Know why you're there. Know how it makes you feel and act accordingly. Um, And that's how you can both control um, the story that you're telling and acting out, how the stories that you're consuming are impacting you, um, and and how you behave in that space. Mm -hmm. Do you ever take media breaks? I, I try. I will take, here's what I will do. I will take a form of media break. I, I, I have not yet graduated to the level of being able to take a break from all, but I'll do like, okay, for three weeks, no Netflix, <laughs> which is funny because really the only thing I watch on Netflix, literally the only thing aside from the occasional documentary <laughs> is West Wing. I, I like, <laughs> I can't stop. I've, I think I've watched the entire series like 50 times, but so sometimes I'll take a break from that. I definitely will take a break from social, um, but I'll play with it. Sometimes I'll say, okay, I'll still post. I just won't consume. I'll get on to, to share, but I won't get on to take. Other times I'll do the opposite. You know, I'll just, I'll just look at my friends uh, to see what's going on in their lives, but I won't follow all the, you know, the gossip sites or the news sites or whatever it is. Um, so I, I try every now and then. Do you ever not read the news? <laughs> oh, yeah. Did, that's, that's not hard for me. Um, <laughs> because I don't like the way it makes me feel. It's so frustrating. And also, because of, because of what my personal professional network has always been, I pretty much stay in the know. I don't even have to, I don't have to read the news to know what's going on because I'm on 976 listservs and I'm you know, signed up for all. Like, I will know what's happening. So I actually don't watch a lot of news. Um, it just annoys the hell out of me. <laughs> So you've found a way to get what you need, but also take care of yourself. You you mentioned self care and how millennials are, um, you know, good or better maybe at self care. Better. Yeah. We, well, I don't know. I know we talk about it more. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. We definitely talk about it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you do it? I think what's I think what's happened with self care is the same thing that happens with most. Um, most uh, epiphanies or movements is that we define them too narrowly. So self-care is different for every single person. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. So for me, I have never had a problem getting a facial and a massage. I will do that. (laughs) I will treat myself. That is my self-care. But am I always eating healthy? No. No. I'm not. I need to. That's that's part of self care, right? Um, I think we we've kind of but notice all the shoulds, right? Yes. It's like self care has become a form of I don't even know what to call it. it's it's like a a form of ritualized, uh, mandated goodness, which yeah. is 
absurd, right? Yeah. And so we're all like, okay, well, I do this form, but I also should be doing this. Or if I was a really good self care person, I'd do it every single day. And yeah, who's got time for that? No, I think who's the question got, who's got space for that? No, I don't. But but I do. I do think you need to make space to ask the question every now and then. Am I taking care of myself? Absolutely. I think it could be that simple. Am I taking yeah. care of myself? And if the answer is no, you'll find out sometimes that the thing you need to do is not like go take a bath. It's like it's say no to someone, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, or, or cancel some plans, or yeah, clo- like close the curtains <laughs> in the middle of the day and just be okay with that. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, in in terms of this generational thing, mm-hmm. so you are a millennial, mm-hmm. and an then OG millennial, an older one, but yes. So I am an OG Gen X. Okay, okay, <laughs> all right. And uh, you know we've got Generation Z starting to become adults. Like they're they're going to be voting. Mm-hmm. They're go- they're coming up, right? Yep. And across these generational divides. That divides. All right. I'll, I'll take that back. That was, again, a very fourth thing to say. Um, but in terms of the generational differences in how we approach story, mm-hmm. what I was really blown away by from, from my location mm-hmm. is that I'm – all right, I'll disclose. I'm turning 49 this year. You look great. Thank you. And 49 is a year developmentally of kind of like clearing it all out, Mm -hmm. clearing it all out. And so I just have a lot less ability to like tolerate the nonsense, Mm -hmm. if you will, from this vantage point. And so this book was so refreshing to me because it's, it was my tool to write the story of that being totally socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. Like, look at how I present. Do you think that people find it acceptable that I don't want to tolerate the nonsense? Probably not, because it's not very nice. Mm -hmm. And so this book is all about, like, the story doesn't have to be nice either. And I feel like a lot of Gen X people have been looking for that permission always, because we are the least born, most aborted, most divorced, least wanted economically at risk generation. I did not know so that. So far, we're also the smallest, so our voice is almost completely silent. So, oh hey, thanks. <laughs> wow. Thanks. I wasn't even pulling that for compassion deep. and empathy and look at what just happened. That was brilliant. <laughs> but if from your perspective as a millennial, mm-hmm. what are stories for millennials and also what do you want Gen Z people mm-hmm. to yeah. know? I mean, I worked with Gen Z almost almost exclusively um, because of Snapchat. Yep. Um, which is so interesting to me because you think you're young until you work with like you. I'm like, oh, what are you, what are you saying, honey? <laughs> like, I felt yeah. very old. Yeah. Tell me about <laughs> it. <huh? laughs> um, uh, and and I'll never I will never forget we had um, one of Diddy's sons in the office. Because uh, I worked with influencers and storytellers. The Creators Lab was a program that I built to engage um, influencers and storytellers and bring them in for in-person experiences and have meaningful conversations, all that stuff. So celebrities and the children of celebrities were often there. And I remember D- Diddy's son because, like, I grew up loving Diddy. And on social, I know, I know who all of his kids are. And I'm like, and they're young. And we all listen to the same music. And we had a great meeting. And I was walking him to the elevator. And he was like, well, thank you, ma'am. And I was like, you got ma'amed. <gasps> I'm in jeans. What are you talking uh, about? <laughs> but like, so the point is, the point is, there are there are definite generational divides and gaps. Um, I think the, the as it relates to kind of the the idea of the book, one of the things that I found to be most fascinating is the difference between being a story consumer and story creators. And that I find the younger you get, um, they are. We talk about yes, how much they are bombarded with messages, absolutely, but they are also natural story creators. Everything they are doing is ultimately creating stories um, on social. TikTok is another really interesting, fascinating platform that is popular right now. Um, I kind of call it like Vine 2.0, but it's just like these really, really short videos with music and they're, make, they're telling stories. Like it's just storytelling is very, very natural to them. Um, and I actually think that's very exciting because if we teach story smarts, if we teach narrative intelligence, the concept of the book, then what we have is a generation of people who are empowered to tell effective stories with a deep understanding of what they mean. That's what excites me. 
What scares me is when you have a bunch of storytellers and story consumers who don't understand either the power of story or the true kind of core meaning of them. That is very, very dangerous. But when you have those skills and you know how to tell great stories and you understand the way that you're processing the world is via narrative, I think the sky is the limit. Um, You know, being an OG millennial, we kind of had a foot in both, right? So um, we... We, I, I believe, were the most marketed to mm-hmm. generation ever, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so when you talk about what are some of the stories that, that we grew up believing or even in the beginning of the book, when I walked away from my career, I was kind of walking away from what I call like the fast company narrative. Um, and I love fast company, great magazine. But just this idea that there is a prototype millennial that is you know, successful and looks a certain way and can somehow also have like, you know, 200,000 Instagram followers while also helping babies in Africa. Never a country, just Africa. Just Africa. Right? Like yes. we have all, all these things. And I'm like, who is that? I don't actually even know that person. Right? The people that I know, you know, are, are drowning in debt. Especially student loan debt. Student loan debt. Um, you know, are, are working jobs that provide some level of fulfillment, but are not all, which is another narrative I kind of push back on in the, in the book, that your job has to be everything, that you're supposed to have purpose and meaning and be able to work from home and, like be, and find your partner. And uh, you don't have to do that all in one job. But, but these are some of the narratives that I think emerged when we were coming of age, mm-hmm. um, let alone the American dream story which is not unique to us, but I think was marketed to us very, very heavily. Um, you know, so you get to a point where you say, like, does this work? Is it working? Uh, and if not, what does it look like to push back on that? And I think that our generation is very uniquely positioned right now to push back, mm-hmm. right? We are, we are, the older ones of us are full-blown adults, <laughs> right? Um, and yet, we we still have access to and a deep understanding of youth culture, popular culture, generally speaking. So we're able to kind of really shift narratives in a powerful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm excited about what's happening now and, and what's going to um, come moving forward. Mm-hmm. And there's so many of you. The there millennials are, are a huge there generation. Are there are a lot yeah. of us. <laughs> us Gen Xers are like, okay, we'll, we'll I guess we'll just along. retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, So in the book, you talk a lot about singing and (laughs) your song life in church. I didn't even remember. I do talk about that a lot in the book. Oh, yeah. Sheesh. I just shouldn't have done that. Okay. Why? Because no one has ever asked me a question about singing, and I'm very afraid of where this is going to (laughs) go. Oh, well, you know, I did want to pull, like, one of those Ellen DeGeneres moments and be like, do you have a song for us? (laughs) No, no, no. no. But I figured, all right, maybe she'll just break out in a song if it's her thing. I don't know. But um, I'm actually going to pull an Allie McBeal on you. And I want to know if you have a current theme song in your personal narrative right now. Yes. That's a great question. Um, I have two. I have two. So, and they're wildly different from one another. One is by an artist uh, named Jamila Woods, who um, I, have be- I, I hear some yeses and some hisses. Um, but she has a song. So, um, uh, her album, I believe, is called, is it Legend? Legend? The, the new album, it's Legend, Legend. And the name of every song um, is based on um, who, is, to her, is an African-American legend of some kind, a, a woman. Uh, and so she has a song named after Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and she has a song, the first song on the album, called Betty. Um, after like the pioneering you know, um, funk rock black woman musician um, uh, Betty Davis, and um, the words are so so powerful. And I, I certainly am not going to sing it a because I don't even I just learned it. But uh, it's all about um, I am not. It says I am not your average girl, and it talks about how running away from yourself is actually more harmful to you. It's just so empowering. I encourage everyone to listen to it. I've been listening to it on repeat for the past week. Um, and then the second song is a song from my childhood. It is a song I grew up singing in church all the time. And it's very simple, and it's called Anointing. And it just says, anointing, anointing, rise in me. And then the second verse will say, anointing, anointing, fall on me. 
Um, and I've been singing it a lot lately because the journey of the book, but also really the journey of my life up until this point has been geared towards trying to figure out who do I need to be to have the most impact. Um, I felt very strongly that I was you know, supposed to carry on my father's legacy. I've always felt a need to serve. I've also always felt the pressure that comes with having certain gifts or talents, but not knowing what to do with them. So the journey was always, who do I need to be? How do I need to build a life that maximizes who I am? And I recently came to the conclusion that the concept that we learned, and I was a kid in church, about anointing, right? This idea of it's not really about you that it's not your responsibility to do that, but what your responsibility is is to surrender and to be anointed, right? Um, the, the, the tradition of having oil poured on, um, onto someone, onto the head of someone who was considered a king or a priest, this idea that you're supposed to be who you are through that anointing. And if I just focus on that, if I wake up every day and say, like, anointing, rise on me, that's how I'm walking through this day, um, and that's how I'm walking in the world, that everything else will take care of itself. Um, so I sing that every morning. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So last question. Yeah. What is next in your narrative? What is next? Um, it's funny. I talk in the book about the, the entrepreneurial narrative and in how like our generation was told that we all need to be entrepreneurs. And even though I, I make very clear in the book, I don't think that's true, don't have that pressure, I also have finally learned that it is who I am. <laughs> that is who I am. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of this, to writing more, but also um, building a company that actually creates spaces for wisdom and meaningful conversation. Uh, so that is, that is my next journey out in the world, is to do this, this thing that I know is my calling. Um, Full time. So I'm doing that right now. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So everyone, thank you for coming out and meeting Erica. Thank you. And thank you so much. You've been listening to the podcast for CIIS Public Programs and Performances. Audio production was supervised by Lyle Barrer at Desired Effect. If you liked what you heard, you can subscribe on iTunes or visit our website, ciis.edu slash podcast. <laughs>